Good evening, everyone. This is the Committee of the Whole Meeting of the DeKalb City Council, November 27, 2017. Roll call, please. Jacobson? Finucan? Here. Marquardt? Here. Fagan? Here. Noriko? Here. Verbeck? Here. Favor? Here. Smith? Here. Seven present. Alderman Jacobson did uh, text me just a couple of minutes ago. He will be a little bit late, but we do expect uh, David to be here for our committee of the whole meeting and obviously the subsequent uh, city council meeting tonight. There are no items uh, that uh, are uh, on the regular agenda here uh, other than we will be talking obviously about the uh, property tax uh, as part and parcel of the uh, discussion at City Council. It is 502 and I'd like to now open a public hearing on the 2017 annual property tax levy. Again a reminder no decisions will be made on the property tax levy during this committee of the whole meeting. We will move whatever discussion we have uh, tonight at public hearing uh, to our regular city council meeting. Before I turn it over to our finance director, Molly Talkington, uh, I would uh, again uh, remind you that during, unlike a city council meeting where we ask people who want to speak on um, any item on the agenda or a specific item to fill out a speaker request form during a public hearing that is not necessary however it would be helpful to me and to the city council here if you do want to speak during the public hearing which is the number one item on tonight's committee of the whole that you fill out a speaker request form. Uh, with those uh, lay of the land items out of the way, I call once again on our finance director, uh, Molly Talkington. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The property tax levy that you see before you is to hold at the same rate as the 2016 property tax levy. So it, in, um, it is basically if you have a market value home at $150,000, the taxable value is a third of that, 50000 So the tax last year would have been for the city of DeKalb, $831. If your value of your house stays the same, and we use the same rate, then the tax amount you pay would be the $831. It would stay the same. And what that covers is a portion of the police and fire pensions at the 7.0 investment rate return, as we discussed in previous meetings, about $518,000 of the property tax levy um, is, the property tax levy is short $518,000 to cover police and fire and the $72,000 for the IMRF levy. So those pension portions are covered by other general fund sources. This levy also covers your um, special service areas, library, and debt service. So the total levy, excluding the debt service that you will abate um, later in the regular meeting, would be an $8.8 .8 .8 million levy. And it covers all those sources. There, again, the caveat on the property tax levy is the same rate is the same tax you pay if the value didn't change in your home. So there are circumstances in which your home could be reassessed and you've gained value in your property, um, you've made significant improvements to your property in other situations, it's a new build, so then you add into the taxable um, base for the city. So if you, you know, invest in your home, if you say it's like a stock market, you put your money in, you want to make improvements, so when you go to sell your home, you sell it at a higher rate, then um, your tax, when you take your money out of the stock market at that higher rate because you've gained money on your initial investment. So as your home gains value, you could have an increase on your property tax levy for the portion of the value of your home increase. So if it was a $150,000 home in 16 and a $150,000 home in 17, there's no change into the annual amount you're paying. But let's say you increase $9,000, 
you will have a $3,000 taxable value that now you also apply that tax rate to. So there would be about a $50 increase to that homeowner. But it, it all um, comes back to what happened to the value of your home. So by levying at the same rate, if the value of the home stayed the same, then the tax that they're paying on an annual basis should stay the same. Thank you. Before we uh, turn it over to uh, any city council questions or discussion, I have a couple. Prior to our city council discussion, uh, I'd like to uh, call on a couple of folks who would like to uh, speak to this from the floor. Uh, the first one person to ask to be heard is Melissa, uh, Melissa Burlingame. again Melissa Burlingame Ward 2 um, just coming to speak up in support of um, the city and our elected officials um, funding our obligations to our residents to our staff members and to our boots on the ground who are getting the work done um, for what the vision that you're setting for the city um, as a person who's been here since 1998 I know it's um, been half of my life uh, more shoot more than half of my life that I've lived in this city and I've um, come to love it and as a um, I own two houses in DeKalb and so I would be one of those $150,000 homes and I would pay what's needed in order to make sure that the city is growing and vibrant and investing in our future. Uh, that's pretty much it for this one. Thank you Melissa. Uh, Richard Fritz. First of all, thank you. Um, I read in the notice that came out in the paper that the overall estimated property taxes for 2007 or the next increase is 5.2 percent. Is that correct? That's what the circulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if it's at 5.2 percent, that means taxes will go up. Okay, based upon the taxes for 2017, which will be paid in 2018. Is that a correct assumption? before I go on with my information. Molly, is that a correct assumption? Um, it's back to the value of your home. So part of that, I should probably come sorry. Um, I figure I should go on the microphone so other mm -hmm. people can hear me. Yeah. So the 5.2% is capturing the growth in the equalized assessed value. So a portion of that is new properties into the city, which is about 41, 42% of the overall growth. So that portion is strictly on new developments in the city. Um, the other portion is on homes that have seen increases in the value of their property. So like I said, if your property value has increased, if you've made significant improvements, if something changed to your home that your value increased, that makes the, up the other portion of the increase in that assessed value. Okay, thank you. So with that said, apparently we've made improvements to our home in the last couple of years that we weren't aware of because our property taxes continued to go up okay and i'm supportive of of our fire and police i think they do a wonderful job in our community and i'm all for providing those resources when i come and i sit back and i look at what we also pay in our property taxes which as i understand is for the schools to fund the school system okay our current school system is ranked 600 and um let's see what is it 638 out of 702 that were were actually uh, um that were actually ranked okay they get um approximately twelve thousand and some odd dollars per student that's what they're spending to educate their students um and I'm not saying they're not doing a good job, but something is wrong with the finances. When you look at the fact that Sycamore is ranked 242, they're getting less money per student, okay, with the same demographic in our region, okay, and we're proposing more and more money. These dollars do not count the outstanding bond issues related to the high school and such or capital expenditures these are just operating costs and educational costs so those are things that I'm, I'm uncomfortable with as a local resident okay I've lived in probably six different states 
the property taxes from the last three states I've lived in on my homes combined. Some of the homes were more expensive than the one I own currently, and one was about the same value as the one I own currently, which is, has a value of about $190,000. If I added all three of those state property taxes all together, they don't equate to what my property taxes are on my home in DeKalb. I'm retired. I retired, I thought, planning decently for my retirement. If it continues in this way, okay, I don't know how many people will continue to be able to stay in their homes, first of all. You get a senior exemption, but then they jack up the price of the, and, the, and the rate of the taxes, so it comes back to kind of bite you in the backside a little bit, okay? Almost 50% of our current labor force work in the service industry, okay? Some of our biggest service providers, okay, our biggest employers, I mean, are like NIU, for example. 2009, they were at about 25,000 students. 2017, they're going to be, or 2016, or fall of, of 17, I mean, they're just, just probably a little bit under 17,000. Okay, you start taking those, and for every primary job, it's anywhere between five and six secondary and tertiary jobs. How long before our economy starts suffering those service industry declines, and the people who are there to buy our homes and provide those support services and tax structures are no longer available because they don't have the resources. Currently, the average income in the area, or the median income in the area, is $38,000. People do the, do the math. How many people making $38,000 can afford to buy a $150,000 house? We pay $170,000 for our home. We put 20% down, okay? Our principal and interest payment is about $600 a month. Our property taxes are just under $600 a month, mm -hmm. twice of what our payment is. I'm not saying that I'm not willing to pay the resources, especially for our fire, police, you know, public service. I almost, I'm willing to pay for education, but there has to be a, st a stopping point somewhere along the line where we begin to look, what is a comparative value? And as citizens, what are we getting back for that value? When we look at two commensurate districts, one right next to the other, and there's a sign on one side and a sign on the other from where you go to one community to the other, okay, and one is educating students at the same value as the other, proportionately, and yet they take so much more money to operate. I just, I just not understanding it. So I'm hoping that the council will look at that seriously, including, and I know I ran over my time and I apologize, but I would, I would encourage the, the council to ask the district to bring in an independent <coughs> a consultant, someone who's not associated, affiliated with anybody in the district, anybody on the council, or anybody in the, you know, in the local community, somebody from outside, to do an audit of the district and find out where is the money going. It's going somewhere, okay? because it's not, there's just the amount of resources that are being spent, and then all of, overall, if we're getting and paying that amount of money and then we're being ranked almost toward the bottom, our students deserve better than that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fritz, um, you apologize for going over your time. Don't apologize. Mm -hmm. And the reason being this is that you hit so many of the cogent points that we, as fellow residents. I'm a senior, I've been here for 56 years, I know about property taxes. And I think the ad that you read from was the black box ad, is that correct, Molly? And we instructed staff during the last two uh, budget workshops that we heard the residents of DeKalb and we did not want any more property tax. Now given the scenario that Molly Talkington try to explain, and I sometimes admit I don't fully ex uh, understand all these numbers, but what we had to do was we had to publish what would have been the top tax increase. Is that correct, Molly? Knowing that our EAVs have gone up over the last year or two, to suggest that we are not going to see a small increase in terms of actual dollars probably is not accurate. And I'm gonna let Molly correct the mayor if I'm incorrect. Um, later on during our 
uh, city council meeting, I'm going to read a letter from a gentleman who pointed out that for each of the seven aldermen up here, plus the mayor, plus the city manager, plus the police chief, we're all going to be paying a little bit more on our tax bills. The tax bills for the city of DeKalb, as you know, amount to about eight and a half, nine percent. Is that a good number? All of that goes to fund pensions, you know. So we are very, very sensitive to so many of the points that you had. As for the school district rating, I cannot explain that, um, nor do I pretend to. Uh, we are charged with city matters, but, but we also realize that the school district takes, what, 65% of your property tax bill goes to the school district. So again, we're sensitive to that. Uh, I pro probably went over my three minutes, but I would welcome any comments from any other city councilman, not only addressing your points and Molly, your explanation of the tax levy during this public hearing. Um, and uh, so I will, uh, I will keep my mouth shut here for at least a while. Any other comments? Could I ask one follow-up question? Sure. When the school district built the new high school, and I know, I, to my understanding, I was not in the community mm -hmm. when that all took place, but that the actual, there was a vote from the community to whether to build a new high school or that not. Is, correct. is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Those assumptions were all based upon what was happening in the community prior to 2007, 2008. Is that a fair assumption? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but the ground was not broken on the new high school, I understand, until late 2009. Is that fairly accurate? because it opened in the fall of 2011. So is there a reason why none of, uh, let me back up and say, none of us would go out knowing that we potentially are gonna have an economic impact to our family or household unit and buy a more expensive home that we're not certain we're gonna be able to pay for without sitting back and letting the dust settle a little bit and figure out where everything lies before we move forward. I know it's water under the bridge because it's sitting out there, okay? But was not it a wise thing for them to have an actuary look at the overall economic issues and what changed in the marketplace before they broke ground and took those bonds? Even if they had to pay a service fee on the bonds for them holding and an interest charge for those bonds, wouldn't it have been preferable and a good service to the community. Not that they didn't need a new high school and not that we don't want the best education for our students, we most certainly do. But do we need a facility that we are probably at the current growth trend, which is going down, okay? Is that probably in our best interest to have a school that we don't can't maximize, but yet we have to pay for? <coughs> I would say, just as a citizen, I would ask and encourage the city council to really look carefully and advise and utilize those resources in the future so we don't get into any more of these financial issues that long term will be, come back to be consequences for the entire community for years and years and years and years and years to come. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your comments. Molly, do you have any comments uh, about what Mr. Fritz may have said uh, as it relates to Again, my contention, and it, I think it's not necessarily a contention, it's a fact that this city council gave clear direction to staff not to increase property taxes for their residents so on their next tax bill. Is that, a, is that a fair assessment of what we did? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hmm? Okay. Right, so that's what council asked and you asked to keep the rate the same. So when city staff is looking at the property tax levy for the city, um, I'm looking at a whole. So there are some properties that gain, some properties stay the same, and some that go down, right? So as a whole, we set the rate um, for our city to, in total, be a net zero game, right? So if you're using the same rate for, from one year to the next, we're just capturing the growth 
in the equalized assessed value. So yes, some owners will pay more, some will pay the same, and some will pay less because it balances out in the bigger picture. Um, I don't levy taxes per household, right? It's the big picture that when we're looking at taxes, how that works. It's also not the, the city doesn't actually assess your properties. We're working off the township assessor. So the township assessor goes out and evaluates properties based on um, what he's seeing in the marketplace, right? And um, it could have been, I know there's been some big uh, sections of town that they've assessed at different points in time. So you guys could all be in that same group that got assessed at the same point in time. There's just different factors in how your properties are assessed. And then that translate into how you would pay on your tax bill. Um, but in the overall picture, if you are keeping the same rate and your property value didn't change, there's no increase to your tax that you'll pay in the following year. It's essentially you're paying on the increase you're receiving on your investment, right? You bought a house, you want to sell it at a higher value at some point in time. Um, and so you're paying on that gain would be what the increase would be for the people who properties were assessed higher than um, where it was last year. So and the tax rate has stayed the same. Right. The EAV has gone up, and it's from that increase or decrease uh, from the EAV upon which the same tax rate is being levied, which will result in either the increase or decrease in the actual dollar amount of the taxes. Right. Is that a layman's explanation that makes sense? Yes. Okay. So, but overall, the taxes would remain um, with the rate. If your value does not change, then your tax amount would stay the same. Okay. Any further comments from City Council? Any further comments from the public on the 2017 annual property tax levy? Yes, Mr. Fritz again, and then Michael. And yes. If the overall cost or debt for the, for the city is going up, and the building permits have not hardly gone up at all, there's hardly any building permits on the capital. Residential. Yeah. Yeah. Where's this growth coming from? Is it already, uh, we don't have any new corporations that are established that I'm aware of. There's um, not a one-to-one -one ratio in the year in which something's built to when it adds to the property tax. So um, property taxes and the formula and how everything's calculated and how the different entities work together, it's very complicated. But it's essentially taking a portion of three different years to give you what the value will be in that following year. So you're, um, there's somewhat of a lag behind of when you would issue a building permit to the time it comes on to the tax rolls. So we have had some improvements in commercial and industrial that have added to that new property. So it might not have all been in residential, though there was some growth in residential. Um, it was, uh, you had a significant portion in um, commercial and industrial and that, <coughs> we wouldn't have seen a building permit pulled for it this year. It might have seen it two years ago for it to finally going to come on to the tax bill in the 2017 year. So there is a delay from when something yes. is issued and built to when we tax it. Michael, did you have a comment? Yeah, I have a comment. Come on up to the mic, would you, Mike? <laughs> come up to the mic, would the you, mic, Mike? Mike. Yes. <laughs> well, it's kind of, actually kind of um, not correct to say that increasing the EAV is because you have an increased value necessarily in taxes. What's happening actually mathematically is when they jack up the EAV, you're actually increasing the rate of tax. Um, and to keep the tax bill constant, you're going to have to lower the tax rate, not increase it. 
So that if you're talking about keeping the tax bill constant, so you would actually have to lower how much you're actually taking in your levy. What, so often what happens is when the tax rate goes, I mean, when there's something happens in the economy, the EAV tracks slowly back down and lowers how much money you can bring, but then the state allows you to raise that levy back up to try to keep the rate constant, in my, if I remember right. And I went through this in 2015 when I had to run. Now, now that the EAV is going up, if you want to keep the no, dollar amount, so if my value goes up but my rate goes down, it'll still increase in some way how much tax, but in the rate value, percentage-wise. It's confusing and complicated, but if my EAV goes up and my value goes up in my house, I'm actually paying more percentage-wise on my house than I was paying before. So effectively, the percentage, w the, if I calculate out how much I'm paying, I'm actually paying more. That's what's confusing people. It's not that the EAV is being said wrong, okay? It's the fact to keep the rate constant, the amount of money, the actual percentage amount of money I'm paying uh, the same. If my house doesn't increase value, but the EAV goes up, I may end up paying more, even if my house doesn't increase in value. So to, do, to keep my house the same, I would have to see an effective EAV decrease. Now, Rockford has dropped the EAV a couple times to do that, okay? I mean, their rate, their levy, not EAV, but their levy a couple times to keep the rate the same. What you're effectively are is still bringing in more money for the dollar. And, and, and in reality, yeah, there are some things that have increased over time, some value. Um, and some of the public bodies are taking advantage of the EAV rate, saying they're not raising your taxes, the EAV is just going up. Well, that's kind of ludicrous, actually. All right, and so I don't have much to say beyond that, but they are raising, you are effectively, if you keep the EAV the same, you are, I mean, not EAV, the, the, the levy the same, the EAV goes up, it's raising your taxes. It's a very simple formula when it comes to that. Thank you, Mike. And for the record, Michael Haji Sheik, Fifth Ward. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Any other comments from the audience on the 2000 and, uh, 17 annual property tax levy. This is a public hearing. Hearing none, it is now 528, and I will close the public hearing. Now, moving on to item number two for our committee of the whole meeting this evening strategic plan FY 2017 third quarter update. Blerta Grechivi, our management intern, will present this update. Blerta. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. I'm just waiting for my PowerPoint to be ready. Okay. I'm standing here to present the FY 2017 third quarter update for the DeKalb 2025 strategic plan. Quick agenda. We are going to go through an overview of the action item status for the items that have been addressed so far for the fiscal year 2017 and I'm going to highlight the key achievements from each of the five visions of the strategic plan. Could you get the mic a little bit closer to your mouth, Blarda? Yes, sure. Thank you. Just a reminder for the city staff, items in the strategic plan are labeled as not started, on track, off track, at risk, achieved, not achieved, or completed during the fiscal year. This graph gives a visual representation of where we are at going through the third quarter of the fiscal year 2017. It shows the status for the overall 82 action items that we are addressing in 2017. At the end of the third quarter, 10 items have been achieved, 
six and nine are on track for achievement, two are off track, and one is at risk. I would like to highlight for you four newly achieved items for this quarter. The first newly achieved item is encourage community leaders to positively promote the city and speak at public, professional, and civic meetings. In their updates for the third quarter, city manager's office, fire, and police department have detailed a total of seven instances in which staff participated in professional and civic meetings. For instance, staff from the police department presented crime and prevention tips to a number of groups throughout the city. These events helped to build relationships with residents of the community. The second newly achieved item for this <coughs> quarter is compared DeKalb with other university communities on key characteristics. Example, crime, academic achievements, and taxes for benchmarking and continuous improvement processes. <coughs> Update, uh, in their updates for the third quarter, finance, information technology, and police department detailed <coughs> two projects, including the first draft of the five-year financial plan, which included several university communities in Illinois as comparable. Additionally, the police department has updated its annual chart of crime statistics and police calls for service, which shows comparisons with other state university cities. In addition to that, a chart depicting housing and quality of life rankings among the state university cities has been compiled from online sources. The third newly achieved action item for this quarter is seek field learning programs and other ways to continue the city's 50 plus years of offering internships to students and explore opportunities for the city personnel to extend their education through university programs. In their updates for the third quarter, departments have updated four instances in which the city manager's office selected two additional management interns from the NIU MPA program Additionally, the fire department hired one staff member and the information technology department selected three interns during the summer through the NIU internship program. Uh, the fourth and uh, final update for this quarter is communicate updates on current infrastructure projects to residents in a timely manner. In their updates for the third quarter, city manager's office and police Public Works detailed six instances in which the city's website and social media outlets were utilized to provide residents with weekly updates on projects slated for 2017. Now to highlight the key achievements of the five visions of the strategic plan. Under vision of sense of place, community development finalized the DeKalb Foodie Guide a brochure highlighting all great places to eat in DeKalb. This brochure, which was designed by OC Creative of DeKalb, is primarily in intended to reach college students and bring awareness to the various business corridors throughout the city. The brochures have been circulated at various meetings and events, and feedback from students have been very po positive. Again, under vision of sense of place, action item, develop aesthetic and image enhancing projects and programs. As part of the hydrant maintenance program this year, Public Works painted 10 hydrants on the DeKalb High School property with the traditional orange and black school colors. Continuing on vision of sense of place, promote and encourage further collaboration between NIU and DeKalb. DeKalb Police Department partnered with NIU Police, Sycamore Police, DeKalb County Sheriff's Office and Texas Roadhouse to raise funds for the Illinois Special Olympics by hosting a benefit lunch. Members of each department waited on tables of Texas Roadhouse and collected tips for the Special Olympics. This event allowed the police department to connect with an underrepresented population in the community while raising funds for a worthy cause. <coughs> Continuing on vision of sense of place, Encourage community leaders to positively promote the city and speak at public, professional, and civic meetings. <coughs> Deputy Fire Chief Jack M Jeff McMaster visited the DeKalb Public Library for story time, followed by a fire safety talk and turnout gear presentation. A turnout gear presentation allows the children to witness the firefighters putting on his turnout gear one piece at a time. The goal was to eliminate the fear of gear and explain why firefighters need to wear the gear while reinforcing fire safety. 
Afterwards, Engine 1 crew joined Deputy Fire Chief Jeff McMaster for a touch a truck demonstrations. Continuing on vision of community vitality and a vibrant downtown, enforce a or update existing regulations to facilitate improvement or removal of, of substandard or unsafe structures thr throughout the city and ensure others are consistent with applicable regulations. The, the city has had long-standing code violations pending with the owner of multiple rental properties in the city, staff from the community and legal devised a plan for the owner to start remediating the property one at a time, start to finish. One of the properties was substantially repaired and is now far more attractive, safer, and code compliant. In this photo, we can see how the property looked before it was repaired. <coughs> While this photo shows how the property looked after it was repaired. Continuing on vision of community vitality and a vibrant downtown. Identify opportunities to actively market the DeKalb Taylor Municipal Airport referencing the current airport marketing plan. Public Works recently became aware of several positive reviews on airnav.com. Airnav is a pilot-oriented website that provides real-time fuel pricing, flight planning, and a common platform for reviewers to review airport services. This is a screenshot from Airnav website uh, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, the last comment, which is from Patrick Moran. He says, uh, stopped in specifically for fuel and route, for fuel and route from La Crosse, Wisconsin to the Cincinnati area. The runways and ramp were in great condition and the fuel price was some of the best in the area. The person working was very helpful and provided me with some windshield, to clear, windshield cleaner to get rid of the bugs. Very friendly service, and I recommend this as a nice stop. Clean facilities are a big plus. <laughs> Once again, the positive reviews fortify the reputation of the airport as a regional leader in the aviation industry. Continuing on, vision of community vitality and a vibrant downtown action item. Encourage community-based public safety engagement strategies and practices. Members of the police department, fire department, and fire department provided demonstration and safety talks at National Night Out. National Night Out is a community event intended to partner public safety personnel and citizens to reduce crime and improve the quality of life. <coughs> Again, under vision of community vitality and a vibrant downtown, implement a complete streets policy in future city planning to improve safety, accessibility, and aesthetics. As part of the 2017 street maintenance program, Public Works instructed <coughs> contractors to upgrade 38 sidewalk corners or ramps to meet ADA compliance. Moving on, vision of inclusiveness. Encourage people who live, work, and learn in DeKalb to become engaged in local activities, governance, volunteerism, lifelong learning, etc. In September, the city began the process of creating the Annie Glitter North Revitalization Plan with the assistance of Camiros, the city's planning consultant. On September 27, the first AGN task force meeting and community meeting were held. This meeting engaged various stakeholders to identify early action projects that will address needs in the AGN neighborhoods. Approximately 140 community members attended the first community meeting. Again, under vision of inclusiveness, participate in multicultural events such as beloved community dinners, local food celebrations, parades, etc. On September 19th, several police officers, elected officials, and other members of the city staff participated in the fourth annual Unity March. The purpose of, this, of the march was to walk in solidarity with people regardless of their eth ethnic origins in order to foster a culture of understanding and embrace diversity.
continuing on vision of inclusiveness, convene a discussion among healthcare providers regarding the provision of mental health services and resources in DeKalb. The police department has been selected as recipient of the Department of Justice Pol Police Mental Health Collaboration Grant in the amount of $75,000. The grant will fund third party research and planning for coordinating efforts of the police department, DeKalb County Mental Health Board, and a number of public service providers to provide necessary aid to underserved individuals with mental issues. Continuing on, vision of accessibility, support infrastructure enhancements for voluntary action center operations, including the proposed transportation facility. The city is submitting a grant application for the Federal Transit Administration Buses and Bus Facilities Infrastructure Investment Program. The purpose of this application is to obtain funding for a new <coughs> transit facility in the amount of $18,280,000 for the full construction of the facility. Continuing on, vision of efficient, quality, and responsive services. Renovate, reconstruct, or replace remaining facilities to meet current and future needs. The fire department received a grant for $2,500 from 3M Corporation to use towards renovating the fire safety house. This grant will improve the safety, aesthetics, and learning environment of the safety house while being visited by thousands of children at public education events. Again, under vision of efficient, quality, and responsive services, <coughs> provide the community with a city hall facility that will address public access, technological, security, safety, shelter, and environmental needs in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and the statutory regulations. Information Technology has worked with Public Works to install four new monitors in council chambers. This decision was made in response uh, to past meetings where public in attendance had issues reading the presentation slides. Uh, moving on, vision of efficient quality and responsive services, communicate updates on current infrastructure projects to residents in a timely manner. Since the st start of the construction season, Public Works has posted a weekly update on the city's ongoing construction projects. Public Works has created a web page on the city's website dedicated to providing residents with weekly updates for the construction projects slated for 2017. Social media was also used to in inform residents. In addition to that, Public Works created three videos for social media. The videos educate residents on current projects and the processes behind them a video on new technology for repairing sun drains and a recent water main replacement received over 1,000 views on Facebook. I would like to show that video, oh. I would like to show that video to you now. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you have an, any questions or suggestions, I would be happy to answer. Before I turn it over to any questions or comments from Council, Blarta, this is, all of this information is on our website, is that correct? Yes. And I know the report that you uh, issued for tonight's Committee of the Whole PDF contains a heck of a lot more information than what you presented us here. Yes. So I would encourage anyone who may be interested in uh, seeing more of this update, if you will, uh, to either visit the website or to uh, take a look at the PDF that was associated with tonight's agenda. With that, any comments or questions? None. Blarita, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Any uh, 
comments from the audience on that particular item? If not, we'll move forward to number three, Park 88 Development Agreement Update. Uh, Community Development Director uh, Joellen Charlton is here to make that presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Byron, if you can please put up the PowerPoint presentation, we'll, we can get started on that. We wanted to take a few minutes tonight to update the Council on the status of some conversations we've been having with the developers of the Park 88 site. Um, the history of that property spans more than 10 years, um, more than many of us have been involved in city government, so I wanted to provide an opportunity to everyone to kind of hear what the original plans called for and some of the things that we're proposing to change with them as part of our discussions. And really, this all uh, came out of the discussions and the approval that we had in 2015 for the most recently constructed 3M plant on that site. So this is a good example of one of those construction projects that gets approved in 2015. It got constructed in 2016. And to your point uh, about taxes, it's probably going to be taxed for the first time in 2017. Uh, and then at that point, potentially only a partial tax because of, of how that gets uh, added into the equation. Um, as part of the approval of that most recent 3M, we were operating under the originally approved contracts for that project. So again, those span back about 10 years. And in an effort to respond to a request by the developer to move that project very quickly, we didn't really have a lot of time to go back and amend the agreement and do all the things that you would normally do to accommodate construction. Uh, we needed to move quickly to secure that uh, project within the community and save the jobs offered by 3M. Uh, so we went through that project and made those approvals with the understanding that 3, or not 3M, but that the developer, in this case Venture One, would come back and go through this amendment process. So we've been spending the last few months uh, trading information and documents and having conversations. So that's, that's the purpose of what I'm going to go through with you tonight in about 10 minutes. So uh, the first slide on the screen gives you an idea where the Park 88 uh, business park is located. At the very bottom of the screen is I-88. On the far east side or the far right side of the picture is Peace Road. The angled road running at the top of the picture is Lincoln Highway. And then the angle on the left side is the um, uh, railroad. So Park 88 is outlined in the black uh, in that location. I wanted to show you this original concept because again, uh, this project was approved over 10 years ago. And the original concept is really a lot different than some of the things we've seen developed recently and that we expect to see moving forward. And part of the conversations we've been having with Park 88 is what we need to do to modify those original approvals. So on the far right side of the screen, at the, far, the lower right hand portion, which is the area um, on the northwest corner of Peace and Fairview, which is along the bottom part of the screen now, um, you see several smaller plots of land. So the original approval for Park 88 contemplated uh, much all, all the bigger projects happening at the west end of the site with smaller commercial developable sites at the east, particularly on that uh, Peace and uh, Fairview intersection. Uh, some additional smaller lots uh, on the north side of Maycomb that you can see, and then some of the, again, larger development happening to the north of that area. That looks a lot different than where we are today. So one of the things that we saw with the most recent 3M, which is uh, the second from the right largest parcel um, on that northwest corner, that's where the current 3M site is located. So as part of making that property bigger to accommodate that nearly one million square foot development, we needed to give up on the commercial development that was anticipated in that corner. Um, and one of the other um, prospects that the developer talked to us about is that many of the conversations he has with other people that are considering DeKalb as a location want to come to that location for the bigger pad sites. There's really very few large development sites in basically the whole state of Illinois that accommodate 
this type of development. And so this is, this is something that he feels would be an attraction uh, to bring people to this location. So again, as compared to the site that we saw before with all of the smaller um, lots on the, on the right side of the screen, we now see those being converted to larger lot developments. Uh, one of the other things I, I had on this slide is a little bit of the history. Uh, again, in 2004 was the original annexation of a big part of this, of this development. It didn't include everything. So the ore property, as some people may understand, is one of the big farm fields on the west side of Peace Road, which is now north of Maycomb Drive, uh, was not included in that original 2004 annexation. That first annexation came in and it really was what set the stage and brought Target, the Target Distribution Center. Uh, that, that property, um, and these, these clickers don't work to show the locations, but it, this is the big property on the north side of Maycomb Drive um, is where the Target is located. Uh, in 2007, we saw the first amendment come through with, uh, to accommodate the first 3M project. And it was 2007 as well where the annexation of the ore property uh, was achieved and, and kind of gave us the whole property that we see today. In 2010, the second 3M project, now these are all uh, the, the two big lots between Fairview and Maycomb Drive. We had the, the two westernmost buildings where uh, the, the 3M buildings are located. Uh, and that second one occurred in 2010. And as I started off by saying, the most recent and the third 3M building came in as a result of some of the changes that were made in 2015. One of the things that will distinguish this agreement from the original agreement is that it is only going to apply to lots that are currently owned by the developer. So the lots that you see in white on the screen are those lots that have already been constructed and sold. So they are no longer owned by the developer. And to go back and amend an agreement that was originally entered into in 2004 with an individual and then have to incorporate all the new owners would be very problematic and something that the developer really didn't want to go through. So this new agreement will address all of the development conditions that will be proposed only for the currently vacant properties. And those currently vacant properties are shown in the map in the gray. Um, so I did want to talk about, uh, again, real briefly, because I know we're limited on time, some of the key issues that we've been discussing with the developer for Park 88. I hit on some of those land use modifications, moving from a commercial, smaller commercial site to uh, some of the larger land use categories. Um, also, uh, and I'm going to back up to one of the original um, documents. Uh, one of the changes that we've spent a lot of time talking to them about are modifications to the interior roadway networks. So when I talked about the small commercial lots on the northwest corner of Peace, you can see a roadway running through between Maycom and Fairview Drive. Obviously, if we, if we move from that commercial development to the industrial larger scale, that roadway will no longer be required or practical. That's about a one and a half million dollar investment that the city would have had under the original proposal that will no longer be part of the new proposal. Also, at the north end of the target site, you'll see an east-west road. It's, uh, again, it's a dark uh, stripe running at the, from the north end of the target site, target site out to Peace Road. That is the location that would align with the planned um, intersection for the properties on the east side of Peace Road that um, the city has an approved plan from uh, a, another multi-faceted uh, development for multifamily and commercial development uh, in that area. So we have we've kind of agreed that the road alignment on the south side of Maycomb Drive is not something that we uh, will need moving forward, but we'd like to be compensated for that. The roadway network to the north is something that is very important, and the reason that it's important um, is that there's a significant part of this project. Um, so the, the boundary at the north, you can see where it ends on the north side of the target site. There's the um, Algus property that is located between the north property line of the target and um, Lincoln Highway. That property is not part of this project, 
and yet represents a tremendous opportunity for the city to be able to provide future development opportunities for uh, the smaller types of industrial development. So we understand and appreciate the need for them to accommodate these larger <coughs> developments on this site, but DeKalb does still have a need and, and gets requests that we don't have the ability to service the smaller industrial developments. So we feel like this would be a really good location for that and we want to make sure through the roadway improvements that are being recommended that we provide access to that property. Right now there is no good way to get into that property. He's not worried about it right now because there's, you know, he's farming it, there's nothing much happening, but if we want to preserve the future opportunity to make that property successful, we really need to pay attention now to what we do with the roadway networks on the Park 88 site. Uh, Fairview access is another issue that was discussed as part of the original agreement. There was some limitations on how many times you could have a curb cut on Fairview and it was limited to three. We currently have more than three. Uh, so as part of our discussions with them, we're talking about doing some updates to the traffic studies to understand what impacts that might have both on Fairview and on the Fairview and Peace Road intersection. Peace Road improvement contributions, um, there has never, other than the intersection improvement, so the signal at Maycom Drive, this developer or the prior developer has never provided any financial assistance for any maintenance or improvements or expansions to Peace Road. Moving forward, uh, staff has been working very um, closely with state and other officials to secure as many grants as we can. And at this point, uh, we feel it is beneficial to work with both the Park 88 developer and Shodine, who is currently the, the uh, developer of site for the property on the east side of Peace Road to make financial contributions to the uh, expansion and or maintenance of Peace Road. And we've done a lot to try and minimize those expenses on both developments. Um, building appearance and landscaping standards. Again, in 2004, when this project was first approved and they thought there was going to be a lot of smaller commercial developments, the design standards included a lot of additional expenses for increased or enhanced design standards and a lot more landscaping. We're taking a, um, a little bit of a, a relaxed approach, but focusing our efforts where it makes sense. And in this particular project, it makes sense to focus our efforts on both Fairview frontages and Peace Road frontages. And if they're on an interior lot, we're not going to be as concerned about the appearances there. Uh, the donation of the municipal site, um, I'm going to back up. There is a small property. There? It's a three and a half, three and a half acre site. Um, uh, at the far west end of the site is, a, is the uh, Maycom Drive curves around and goes to the south. That was included as part of the original agreement to be dedicated to the city for uh, either uh, a fire station site or other public purpose. And we're asking at this point that that land go ahead and be dedicated to the city for us to either utilize for, for a purpose that uh, could involve public safety. We've talked about truck scales and other um, things that could be beneficial to the city. So we're going to be working with them on that dedication. Um, Lincoln Highway commercial. Again, I'm going to back up. So at the very top right section, you can see portions of the development site that touch onto Lincoln Highway. And it touches Lincoln Highway almost at the corner of Peace and Lincoln. So we have the nice new development of the Casey's on the north side. We felt it would be really important to preserve commercial um, uses on that part of, of their site. Their original proposal came in and they were looking to put some stormwater facilities up there based on, on the type of building that was going on the lot to the south of that area. We may still need to provide them with that opportunity, but what we're telling them at this point is we're willing to be flexible. If you need that, that site to put a really big building on, we can talk to you about using the north end of the property next to Lincoln Highway for your stormwater detention. But if you don't get that million and a half, two million square foot user on that site and can preserve property next to Lincoln Highway for commercial uses, that would be our preference. So that is something that we're working with them as well on. And then finally, what I wanted to talk about is um, the Lincoln 
or I'm sorry, the Fairview Avenue bike path. That is something that was included in the original agreement. And I don't know so much about this council, but I know the prior council had conversations with staff to make sure that that is something that we move forward with. And we've been having that conversation with the developer. I think that um, that requirement or that request has been justified by the many times that staff and elected officials have approached us saying, did you see that guy walking down the middle of the suicide lane on Fairview Drive? Mm -hmm. um, coming to or from their jobs. And, and I think you can drive down Fairview uh, at just about any time of the day. Uh, I was driving down Fairview after a 10.30 meeting the other night and, and three guys on bikes with lights were going in both directions. So it is something that we're concerned about. Um, the original agreement did provide a requirement to go for the full width of the site. So from the west end of the site all the way to Peace Road. We are working with them to only extend the bike path to the westernmost entrance of the Panduit site. So it's just a little over half of the distance. And again, it's, it's in an effort to work with them on the cost of that improvement. One of the issues that came up uh, on trying to locate that type of an improvement is that there's very little right of way to be able to accommodate the 10-foot um, the path that's required without having to secure easements from property that the developer no longer has control of. So just real quickly moving forward, we wanted to give you this brief overview. Uh, we'll finalize our discussions with the developer. Once that's accomplished, we'll do a public notice for a public hearing. This does need to go before the Planning and Zoning Commission for a public hearing. Uh, we'll get additional feedback from them and from the members of the public, uh, and then bring those recommendations back to council for further consideration. So again, real quickly, I've already gone over my time frame. sorry. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I understand there are no uh, folks in the audience who have indicated a desire to speak to this item, but I would like to turn it over to City Council for uh, any questions or discussion on this Park 88 update. I will say this, that I have been uh, very involved in some of the economic development issues since I've become mayor. Uh, and this particular developer is anxious, I think, as we are, to see some of that additional development. This is a site, I think, that will hopefully see some, some real activity over the next uh, uh, year or two. Uh, and this uh, amended development agreement uh, will be critical uh, in, uh, in laying the groundwork for that to happen. Thank you, Joellen. Thank you. The final item on the uh, Committee of the Whole meeting is public participation, and we have had one other, per well, not actually the same person, Melissa Burlingame, who would like to speak to uh, something that perhaps is not listed on our agenda tonight. So, Melissa, if you'd come forward. Melissa Burlingame, second ward, correct? Yes. So thank you for allowing me to speak at the Committee of the Whole. I cannot stay for the City Council meeting. My daughter is in the back, um, getting a little antsy from being here. Um, and so um, I did send this in a letter form, but I wanted to make sure that it was shared publicly. Um, and so um, wrote um, that these are some issues that are important to me, my family, and my um, friends in the community. So that we have a family-friendly city. I request that the City Council bring the STEAM Learning Center back into the discussion. I repeatedly hear um, about people leaving DeKalb to find fun opportunities for children. We should have this resource for the, our community that also drives development in the downtown. At the meeting where it was discussed, nearly twice as many people wrote or spoke in favor of the center, but council members decided that there was not enough support to move forward. I think this discussion needs to be reopened. Meetings with childcare, <coughs> as you can see, brought my seven-year-old. Um, I know that there would be people would be more likely to attend meetings if there was an option. So not every meeting, but if it was requested um, for some service to watch children. I request action uh, to make public participation easier for residents in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Those people most likely to have young families. Security. 
I'm willing to pay for the safety of our neighbors in the northwest section of town. Their safety affects me and my family and our community. The police department has proposed adding officers to work those woefully understaffed and underserved times, and I support the increased taxes as a way to ensure security of citizens in our community. A budget that funds pensions for police officers and fire professionals. Uh, this would require additional revenues, uh, similar to the case needed for our state um, of Illinois pensions. I urge you and council members to fund our obligation to our employees who serve our community. A budget that invests in development, as we were just learning about. Um, aside from the letter, development helps with our equalized assessed value. That's the bottom part of the fraction. The larger the bottom part of the fraction, um, the more that our tax base gets spread among um, commercial, industrial, and residential. So if we keep growing that bottom portion of the fraction, we can eventually lower the rate, which is a fraction, you know, but and still fund everything. Oh no, my letter. One moment. Okay, doke. Um, okay. So a budget that invests in development. Funding cuts to city services and projects would diminish our ability to bring in tourism and new residents through marketing and community events at the exact time, at the exact same time that we need a stronger tax base to cover funds that the state of Illinois is not sending us. I believe in the idea of spending money to make money and that we need to invest in the city to make it more appealing to bring in tax dollars. Fewer police officers, poorer streets, and empty downtown storefronts will not bring in new tourists or residents. As you can see, in Europe and other states in the US, austerity measures have not improved economic conditions for those communities. So back in 2008, when people were trying to really cut expenses, um, it has actually backfired on them, and they have had poorer economies as a result. Um, so I urge you and the council to think about the long-term well-being of our community. Thank you for your service. And uh, if these could be shared at the regular meeting, that would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you, Melissa, and uh, I have a gentleman here. Who I don't have any form for you, sir, but if you'd identify yourself. Uh, I did fill out the form, Mr. Mayor. I didn't know I had okay, form. no problem. Yeah, if anyone does have another form for our council meeting, uh, do bring it up to Sue Herman, who is our uh, city clerk over here. Um, Richard Riley. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, um, fellow aldermen and women. I'm seeking a continuance on an item that's on your regular agenda. I don't know if this is a proper you know, time to do it, but if we could do it, it would be, it would be a kind act. Uh, this is item G7. Uh, it's a special use by Verizon. This matter comes before you. I would ask that this matter be continued to either the first or second meeting in January, which will give me an opportunity to respond to the findings of facts which were delivered to me only on Friday and holiday Friday three days ago. Um, the record is being printed uh, of the hearing and uh, that should be done in two to three weeks. We're in the middle of the holiday season. I think it would be well for everybody if we could continue this into uh, January and so ask. Okay, I don't think we're going to probably discuss that at this point, uh, Mr. Riley. However, I will, between this meeting and our city council meeting, at which we will discuss this, okay. um, I, will, uh, I will check with our city attorney, unless he'd like to make a comment now. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll discuss and see if that request to move that uh, to, uh, to another meeting in January is appropriate. All right, thank okay? you, sir. You're welcome. <coughs> Any other items for the Committee of the Whole uh, from our City Council? Before I call then for a motion to adjourn, uh, I'd like to inform the public, uh, those of you who have been anxiously waiting for our next meeting, our City Council meeting, and that City Council meeting will start promptly at 6.20 in about 10 minutes. I'd uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the Committee of the Whole. So moved. Second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 Oppose? No. We are adjourned. City Council starts at 620. Thank you.
Bring them in. Beautiful weather. Bring them in. Thanks, Wayne. How are you? I saw that.